Good morning, everyone. So it's nice to be back here with everyone at Empower Ed. Uh, we are so happy to welcome you to the, a very special event that we have uh, prepared for, for our dear teachers um, around the Philippines. So welcome to the 2020 International Online Forum on Empowering Indigenous Cultural Communities in a Pandemic. And this is a very special event because for the first time, um, Empower Ed has worked with um, very special institutions that has been championing the rights of the indigenous people that uh, that are uh, that uh, who belonged in our uh, in our community right now. Um, this uh, international forum, online forum, um, is uh, is a collaboration of three important institutions. Number one. Um, it is a brainchild of one of my friends, uh, one of the guests that we have seen in Empower Ed, uh, Dr. Jesus Incelada, and he represents um, the school divisions office of the province of Iloilo. And we are very happy because together with the SD, uh, SDO Iloilo, uh, our main partner also is, of course, the Department of Education. But more importantly, we're very happy that uh, Director Margarita Ballesteros, um, heading the International Cooperations Office, or ICO of DepEd in Central Office, has uh, taken part in this very, very important uh, milestone um, in, in celebrating um, the indigenous uh, cultures, uh, cultural communities in the Philippines. Um, just a few highlights. Um, this is for the first time that Empower Ed is celebrating uh, we've celebrated uh, our indigenous uh, cultural communities, but this is a very, very special event. So what I would like to do right now is um, first introduce myself. Um, if you've been watching Empower Ed, uh, I am Francis Jim Toscano. I am a Filipino teacher, and Empower Ed is a as an education advocacy that I have started a year ago. And I'm very much thankful because DepEd ICO's head, Dr. Margarita Ballesteros, has been one of the main supporters of Empower Ed. And together with me are the different um, people, uh, mainly from my Global Teacher Prize community, like Dr. Jesus Insulada, who's been very, very supportive. So just to give a background, why are we having this international online forum? Um, I'm pretty sure you will hear a lot from our um, guests and speakers, but just to highlight that the Department of Education strongly supports the indigenous peoples through its Indigenous Peoples Education Program, or the IPED. In observance of the National Indigenous Peoples Month 2020, which is this month, um, and in the context of the pandemic, DepEd has adopted the theme, Hamon ng Pandemia ating harapin, gabay ang katutubong karunungan at giting. The 2020 International Online Forum on Empowering Indigenous Cultural Communities in Time of the Pandemic is an online discussion on initial gains and best practices of the Department of Education through the Indigenous Peoples Education in promoting partnerships with Indigenous cultural communities and various agencies around the globe, and to gain knowledge and insights and translate this into actions as we continue to battle COVID-19. Speakers from various educational institutions and agencies from the Philippines and from around the globe will be invited for the, uh, to share their best practices and insights on management of risks, resilience in indigenous practices, and protocols to safeguard IP areas while education continues at the comforts of the learners' homes through distance learning modalities. So this is a very, very special event because you know, we're, dealing a, uh, we're dealing a lot of problems right now. We have the COVID-19 pandemic, we have, of course, the distance learning that we're having right now. So to let us know more about these things that we are doing for our brothers and sisters who belong to the indigenous uh, cultural communities around the Philippines, we have created a platform, which is this one, to make sure that we get to know more, get to know more about the best practices that we're having right now. So while this is an international online forum, we're very much comfortable uh, to say that if you have thoughts, if you have questions, please make sure that you uh, type in your comments. Uh, we are live uh, broadcasting across multiple platforms right now in, on Empower Ed TV and YouTube, um, in DepEd and, uh, and ICO's uh, Facebook page. 
Um, this is an online forum, so we kindly ask everyone to maintain a very respectful, um, a very respectful stance, a very respectful attitude to our speakers, to everyone uh, that are part of this one. Uh, we are celebrating our brothers and sisters uh, who belong to the different indigenous cultural communities. So let us show respect uh, to each and everyone. So thank you so much. To start, I'm gonna call first our first. Um, um, speaker, she's gonna welcome us to this event. She's no other than one of the most important persons uh, for this event, uh, Dr. Margarita Consolacion C. Ballesteros. She's the director of the International Cooperations Office of the DepEd Central Office. Good morning, director. Good morning, Jem. Good morning, uh, Philippines. And good morning, everyone. On behalf of the, uh, the Department of Education, through our very uh, dynamic and strong-willed Secretary, the Honorable Leonor Marcos Briones, I would like to say hello world and hello Philippines to our uh, friends who are uh, joining us all the way from the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia, Welcome to this morning's event. It's been a while since Jim came in with Empower Ads uh, events. And this morning we're lucky and we're fortunate to for him to have actually uh, said yes to co-host this um, celebration, the celebration of life, the celebration of gifts of persons and gifts of diversity in the Philippines and of course in the world. Over the last 20 years, indigenous people's rights have been increasingly recognized through the adoption of the international instruments and mechanisms such as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or what we call the UNDRIP in 2007, the American Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous Peoples in 2016, and of course the um, ratifications of indigenous and tribal peoples convention from 1991 establishments of the un permanent forum on indigenous issues the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples and the un rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples on the 23rd of december in 1994 the un general assembly adopted the resolution number 49 214 that the World Day, that is the International World Day actually of the indigenous peoples be observed on the 9th of August. And we met on the 9th of August and that was a Sunday at the time. But here in the Philippines, there's also another proclamation which was signed by then our president, um, Her Excellency uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, declaring that the month of October is also an IP um month so this morning the through the international cooperation office we're bringing you um international speakers as well our local speakers who will also be um highlighting the importance not only of their existence but their role in society and in communities and at this time of the pandemic we are lucky we are fortunate we are blessed that at some point we are slowly, slowly recognizing that value of oneness, that value of seeing each other's needs to address issues and concerns at this point in time. So on behalf of my colleagues at the Department of Education Central Office, I would also like to, to say, Thank you, CI, through the leadership of USEC Desdado San Antonio and the other undersecretaries and assistant secretaries who have been very supportive. And to all of us who are here viewing us from north to the southern part, from the northern part to the southern part of the islands of the Philippines, have fun while you view and while you listen, you try to internalize into our IP brothers and sisters. We are one with you in this celebration and we wish to thank the National Commission of Indigenous Peoples also who will be joining us later. To Dr. Encelada, who is now in the Visayas at the moment and to his team, 
thank you for co-organizing this event and to Ryan and the rest of the crew of the ICO who are at the office, physical office right now. Thank you. And for all the support, for all the love, this is all for our brothers and sisters with and for the Philippines and in the Philippines. So magandang umaga. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Director Margarita Ballesteros, and we are very lucky to have you here. Um, and, and we wish you uh, your safety at this time of the pandemic also. Thank you. Now, on to our next uh, speaker who will give us a message. Um, we are welcoming Ms. Maria Lori Victor, uh, who hails from Benguet province and is of Kankane and Visayas parentage. She was involved in community-based education initiatives for indigenous cultural communities since 1998. In 2011, she was invited to be part of the technical assistance team to assist the Department of Education in implementing the Philippines' response to indigenous peoples and Muslim education, or what we call the PRIME program, whose goal was to increase institutional awareness and response to the needs and concerns of indigenous and Muslim learners and serve for two years with DepEd Coldillera Administrative Region, which I would like to note, I'm from CAR also, so it's nice to have someone from the same region. So let us, well, uh, with the commencement of DepEd's Indigenous Peoples Education Program in 2013, Ms. Victor was requested to provide technical assistance to the Indigenous Peoples Education Office as a consultant. She is presently a senior technical assistant with this office. Good morning, Ms. Maria. We are very lucky to have you here to listen to your message. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, perhaps good day would be more appropriate given that we are from, or probably we are coming from different time zones. Uh, magandang araw po. And uh, first, we would like to warmly greet everyone uh, as we celebrate our Indigenous Peoples Month here in the Philippines, uh, which we are sure you know, the rest of the world um, also is with us in solidarity in spirit. To our guests who are with us today, thank you for joining us, for being with us in sharing your stories um, regarding how we continue our advocacy for indigenous people's education, which also has been a long journey especially for our communities who have strongly advocated for this, even during the times when this thing we are now calling as IP education was not even yet uh, something accepted or given adequate attention. Um, we have heard from uh, Director Ballesteros earlier, the international journey when it comes to the advocacy for indigenous peoples. And here too in the Philippines, the country has contributed its part we have, for example, the Indigenous Peoples Rights Act, which was a decades-long struggle of our indigenous communities to become a law. And in a few years after the release of that law, a major issue that was brought forth was the need for appropriate education for indigenous cultural communities in our country. And in time, this advocacy became popularly, popularly called Indigenous Peoples Education. Through the years and decades of uh, campaigning and advocating, there came a point when it was possible to dialogue with the Department of Education. And by that time, the policy environment was ripe for a very fruitful dialogue resulting in what we now have in the Department of Education um, as the Department Order 62, which came out in 2011. That is a comprehensive policy framework providing long-term directions for the department, for our national education system, when it comes to uh, coming up now with what we call the Indigenous Peoples Education Program. We are strongly uh, a fruit. The IPED program is a fruit of the years and years of advocacy and campaign of our indigenous cultural communities, whom we honor this month. Because it, is because it is because of their efforts that we are now actualizing their aspirations, hopefully putting in place the needed mechanisms, processes, and policies 
to make those aspirations a reality at the community level. And today we are thankful to all the organizers of this uh, international forum because we are once again remembering how our work in, in the various agencies, particularly in the field of education, uh, is giving its energies to our communities this time in the context of the pandemic. The IPED program in the country is relatively young. We are just uh, seven years in actual field implementation. And through these seven years, there have been key milestones, key uh, achievements perhaps, or more like milestones, no? milestones that tell us that, okay, we have taken major steps in actualizing indigenous people's rights, particularly in, in education. And now as we, as we confront this pandemic, it is uh, a major challenge. The ITED program is like a young plant. I would analog analog analogize it that way. And when uh, storms come, it can be vulnerable. It can be, uh, yeah, it can be vulnerable. And when we reflect on that, we are moved to commit ourselves that whatever happens through this pandemic, we will do our best to protect whatever initial gains have been made possible by our communities in partnership with the department. And as we see through this crisis, one of the things that we will also do is to be open, to be mindful, to be sensitive to opportunities that may be coming in, even as there are difficulties, so that the IP ed advocacy can continue on as we hopefully move towards recovery and later on towards, as they were saying, building back better. So to everyone, thank you for our effort to come together, to embrace each other's strengths, to support each other in all these challenges, knowing in faith that we will all see this through. So once again, marami pong salamat. Thank you to everyone. And may our efforts continue as we move towards recovery and rebuilding. Thank you so much, Ms. Maria. Uh, very inspiring message. And we, uh, we agree with you uh, in terms of the need to be more, you know, for us to, to put more effort into our new, new and young IP ed program. And we're very confident that we will push through with this. And this is a platform where we can share much about it. Thank you, Miss Maria, and we pray for your own safety and good health at this time. Thank you so much. Now, everyone, so we have done, uh, we have listened to Dr. Mar uh, Dr. Margarita Ballesteros and Miss Maria Victor. We have two uh, other messages, recorded messages that have been sent to us, so we will pay them for you to listen. Uh, just to introduce to you, uh, we have uh, a special message from Dr. Ruel Bermejo. She, uh, he is the Schools Division Superintendent of the Schools Division of Iloilo Province, uh, one of the co-organizers of this special event for our um, IP Ed celebration. And the other one, the other message from Dr. Ethel Agnes Valenzuela. She is the, currently the Deputy Director for Program and Development uh, of the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, or the CIMEO. So, for in a few uh, in a few seconds, you will be hearing a special message from Dr. Ruel Bermejo and Dr. Ethel Agnes Valenzuela. Indigenous peoples in all regions of the world have a long history of suffering and devastation from epidemics and pandemics brought by intrusion and colonization, like the arrival of the first Europeans in the Americas, who brought smallpox and influenza to a measles outbreak among the Yunnami of Brazil and southern Venezuela in the 1950s to the 1960s that nearly decimated the tribe. This time, COVID-19 presents a new threat to the health and survival of the individuals who are considered in most countries as most vulnerable sectors. 
According to the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Economic Analysis of the United Nations, indigenous peoples have significantly higher rates of communicable and non-communicable diseases than their non-indigenous counterparts. High mortality rates and lower life expectancies due to malnutrition and undernutrition. Poor access to sanitation. Lack of clean water and inadequate medical services. Additionally, indigenous peoples often experience widespread stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings, such as stereotyping and the lack of quality in the care provided, thus compromising standards of care and discouraging them from accessing healthcare if and when available. Last August 9, 2020, we celebrated the International Day of the Indigenous Peoples and the whole world focused on celebrating the Indigenous knowledge systems and practices of the Indigenous communities and how these work on managing the threats and risks brought by the present pandemic. Support systems have been provided to Indigenous cultural communities for them to protect themselves and sustain their needs. We acknowledge the idea that we need to learn with indigenous cultural communities in facing the present pandemic. And at the same time, we need our support towards their sustainability and self-governance. One best way to support the indigenous cultural communities is through education. As we celebrate the National Indigenous Peoples Month in the Philippines and the whole country is determined and positive that the test of time can be overcome and shall come to pass. From policy making to implementation, the Indigenous Peoples communities have been involved to come up with culture sensitive and community based preventive and mitigating measures and strategies. For the Department of Education's Coach Division of Iloilo, through the Indigenous Peoples Education Section, we have been doing our part in empowering the Indigenous cultural communities through education and community involvement and collaboration. It has been close to a decade since IPED has been implemented, and we have identified initial gains and we continue to work in making education, culture sensitive, relevant, liberating and empowering on the part of our IP learners and the indigenous communities we serve. This international online forum is one activity that would showcase our initial gains, our strengths rooted in our practices, innovations and real triumphs in the implementation of the IP Ed and in strengthening our partnerships with indigenous communities and other stakeholders for the education of our IP learners. May this activity also offer us a moment to reflect on how indigenous and non-indigenous communities work together and how much promise there is from ongoing initiatives to support and engage these communities of much to teach the world about heroism, resilience, environmental protection, respect, faith, and harmony among others. This time, we let them educate us, we educate them, and we learn together. I would like to thank the International Cooperation Office of the Department of Education and Empower Ed for spearheading this trailblazing activity and for, for inviting us to be part of this timely dialogue on facing the present pandemic, to learn with our indigenous community partners and to strengthen our partnerships with them and other stakeholders for the learning continuity of the youth, including the IP learners. We look forward to more engagements like this to share our best practices and at the same time, learn from the stories of others. Indeed, we live together. We learn with each other 
and we heal as one. Para sa batang IP, tayo'y magbayanihan. Boylo, ilo-ilo. To the distinguished organizers of this 2020 International Forum on Empowering Indigenous Culture Communities in the Time of Pandemic, Department of Education International Cooperation Office, headed by Dr. Margarita Balesteros, official staff, esteemed speakers, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Isang magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Southeast Asia is home to indigenous peoples and cultural communities. In the report of the International Labor Organization, the rights of the indigenous peoples in Asia, two-thirds of the world's indigenous peoples are estimated to live in Asia. In other words, approximately 260 million people representing 2,000 distinct civilization and languages. We call them hill tribes, indigenous nationalities, tribal people, ethnic minorities, natives to testify the variety of experiences in the region. Yet, such diversity notwithstanding the situation of these people shows important communities and consequent similar challenges concerning the persisting marginalization which has cultural, social, economic, and political dimensions. The fact that indigenous peoples continue to be among the poorest of the poor even though sustained growth and poverty reductions efforts of the regions have significantly contributed to declining poverty rates is a stark reminder of the unique challenges faced by indigenous women and men in the world but covid 19 has affected everyone in a scale that never has been seen before. For its part, Simeo has responded to the call of the Ministers of Education during the Ministerial Policy e Forum to ensure that the underprivileged, the disadvantaged, the unriched are able to benefit from educational solutions wherever they may be. During the special forum on reaching the unriched, High officials of the Ministries of Education also share their plans and programs in ensuring that all are reached by innovative learning programs and the learning continues no matter what. For its part, during and before the pandemic, we have already developed some innovative programs linked with indigenous cultural communities. For example, in the early years of this decade, we have worked on the development of mother tongue-based multilingual education in Southeast Asia, the time it was funded by the World Bank. And Simeo Secretariat has worked closely with different ministries of education in the development of community-based teaching learning materials for multilingual education. Simeo Inotech also helped in the development and crafting of the MTB MLE law programs and even doing case studies of the Aita Magbukon community in Bataan, where I personally headed that research. And in that research, it was revealed that learners were more engaged and active if mother tongue is used in their classes. And they also get high scores, high test scores, if they use their own native language. One of the key takeaways from this pandemic is that we should work together so that we bring back students and learners to where they are, to what we consider as normal. I want to end this presentation by having a positive outlook. Like while we cannot and should not long, no longer go back to the old normal, there is a new normal that awaits us, and that is with the community's assistance, partners such as those in this meeting today, we can build back better. We can have a better learning for the indigenous communities and to everyone. 
I wish you all a fruitful discussion and thank you very much for your time. All right, so we are very grateful for the uh, inspiring message and encouraging messages of Dr. Ruel Bermejo, uh, Schools Division Superintendent of the Schools Division of Iloilo Province, and Dr. Ethel Agnes Valenzuela, Deputy Director for Program and Development at the Simeo in Bangkok, Thailand. Now, we are very special to welcome six amazing speakers um, from all the way from Canada to the different parts of the country. Uh, one uh, up north in one up north in Apayao, in Iloilo, and then in even in Mindanao. So we're very very happy to welcome our speakers, Ms. Maggie McDonnell, Commissioner Jennifer Pia Limpayan Sibuglas, uh, Dr. Chandler Ibabao, Ms. Elsie Padernal, and Ms. Lord Jane Dordas, and Dr. Sadat Minanda. They will be our they are our main speakers, and they will be sharing about how they have continued to fight and champion for our indigenous uh, cultural communities, uh, brothers and sisters in their own communities. They will be touching area, uh, the different areas on literacy, health risks, customary laws, um, health practices and risk, uh, risk management, and even, uh, even social emotional learning on how they support um, our learners in the different IP cultural communities. So, well, we don't have uh, anything to say right now, but we are very, very excited to welcome them into our forum. And we will start with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Chandler Ibabao. Dr. Ibabao joined the Department of Education on September 28, 2007, and got promoted as Teacher 3 on December 2010 and graduated with her master's degree in 2013. So she is a very hardworking and honest employee who takes work very seriously, which helped her a lot in passing the principal's test. She exudes exceptional perseverance and possesses commendable work ethics. Moreover, she is a source of inspiration for other employees who want to get the best out of their job. Duties when she won the best performing teacher in the division of Apayao. And was, one, and was one of the finalists in the regional search for best performing employees in 2018. She was then awarded um, as the Elias Award as best teacher last December 2019, at the same time finalist for the Mother Teresa Award in Cordillera Administrative Region. She is also a second round qualifier for the 2009 Metrobank founding Outstanding Filipinos, Out, Outstanding Filipinos Award for Teachers. Recently, uh, she really works hard and always tries to lift the spirits of those around her, especially in her indigenous cultural community. She started her project AITA last October 2019, which makes her busy on weekends. Re recently, she won third place among the 200 entries on the UNESCO APC EIO Challenge on Video and Photo Contest for the 2020 online SSAEM conference. So we are very happy to welcome Dr. Chandler Ibabao from Apayao. Hi, Dr. Chandler. Good morning, everyone. Good day. Uh, I will be sharing to you how Project ATA started. Uh, the topic was uh, personally chosen by Sir Jesus Insilada on how to give literacy on our IP brothers and sisters, particularly in my own community here in Apayao. Allow me to share my screen so that I can start my topic. Cheers.
Okay. Can you see it now? So Project ATA means Accessible Education to Agtas. Why Project ATA? Because it has always been my dream to help this community. Since childhood, I was able to see how they cope up with life. And my heart really goes for them because I want to really help them on how to be one of the useful citizens in our country someday. How many children are the beneficiaries of this project? There are 17 school-going age Agta children in our own barangay, Kapanikyan, Puto, Lapayao. And they are composed of 14 Agta families. And this project is started last October 20, 2019 and up to the present. I usually conduct the literacy program or the literacy sessions in our own barangay hall before the pandemic. So this project is a community-based project. Our barangay is the second largest populace among the 22 barangays of Puntola Payao. So among these residents is a small community of Agtas. It's just uh, maybe 15 minutes away from my residence, so I could walk easily from my home to their community. So if you can see here in the picture, this was my first visit to the community. Uh, I am wearing just the simple, uh, the usual household attire to make them comfortable during my first visit. I don't have to wear any glamorous attire so that when I will be interviewing them, they will feel So I had, before the implementation of the program, I had an initial meeting with the barangay officials during their regular session last September 28, 2019, to inform them about the project, the purpose, the objectives, and on the different benefits to the community. We explained it to the chieftain of the tribe uh, in the person of Anoy Loretta, and they uh, heartily accept the project. So this is their actual community. So first, I started documenting its session step by step. The picture was taken last October 13, 2019, when I interviewed them. Uh, I profiled every family in order to address some of their needs for me to make it easier on what could I give through the help of good-hearted individuals. So this was the project launching during the General Assembly of the Barangay last October 20, 2019. If you can see there, the person here in front, that this is the chieftain of the tribe. And these are the barangay officials, and they are in full support of this program. So this was our first literacy session last October 27, 2019. With the help of my three kids, namely... Natsrel, Thiel, and Alize, they are helping me holding the hands of these little Agta kids on how to hold the pencils because most of them really did not enter formal schooling. You can see here we are just using monoblock chairs in the old barangay hall. So this is my second child helping me on how to teach the children, write their names. I really started from the basic, writing straight line, because most of them really 
don't know how to write. Then this was the second session. Uh, it happens to be that the IP or the four-piece ML in the person of Ramon on came to see and visit them and help me take the session. So here is ML Ramon Antonio. That is my youngest child. And this is my second. This is my uh, niece. I really involved them during this literacy sessions because I want them that while they are still young, they also learn how to help others. And they really uh, volunteer themselves. They are excited every session, every Sunday. They are the one uh, excited when we go to this uh, Barangay Hall to teach these young Agta kids. This was taken last November 10, 2019, when I personally visited their houses just after the Tropical Depression PL. The, their houses were really flooded, so they evacuated to the Barangay Hall. But look at them, they still smile. Hope is still in their eyes that someday they would, they would get out from this uh, kind of living. So after visiting them, I conducted the third session. So this one is again Uncle Anoy, whom I usually call him. And this is uh, Mom Marjorie Galot from the NCIP. Uh, she was the sponsor of their meal during this session, just right after the Typhoon Kiel. So if you can see here, we were serving hot Mickey for the kids and for the whole community as well. Right after the session, there is feeding. Okay, November 17, the fourth session, I started introducing the vowels, A, E, E, O, U, or A, E, I, O, U. With the help of my kids again, of course. Okay. And on November 17, uh, two of my cousins in the person of Melanie Vidad and Eva Leonila sponsored the kids' snacks. Not only the kids, but also to the parents who accompany their children during or every session so this one is the uh, snack session or snack after the lesson or after the literacy session and here are some sleepers given by my cousins to be distributed to them they are very happy because they received new sets of sleepers look at this mother she's very happy taking selfie okay this one uh during the evacuation again because that time uh it's almost every week that their houses are flooded so i have to really go to them visit them by just showing your empathy to them they are very happy and during this night, I assisted the Department of Social Welfare and Development and the barangay officials in giving relief to them. Another session, this was December 2019, and this is our fifth session. If you can see here, there are many snacks. This was provided by our Honorable SB Kit Lawat, who is a great supporter of this project and mom kyle bullet gave some of her new stuffed toys to the kids and some pre-loved clothes given to them all the clothes worn by these kids are already those 
who, uh, what came from the gifts of Mom Kyle Bulut, our uh, sang, uh, provincial board member, who is also in great support of this endeavor. Okay, this now is the seventh session, still in the old barangay hall of our barangay. So as I have said a while back, every session, there are these good-hearted persons who really sponsor. And I am very thankful to them. Most of them doesn't want to be mentioned. When I post it on my social media account, they really uh, reiterate it to me that please do not mention us. So they are giving this anonymously. And I really thank them for that. This was last December 24. Uh, Pamaskong Handog for the whole family, for the whole community. And this was sponsored by a good friend of, man, of mine back in college in the person of Miss Claudine Respicio together with her two sisters and her friend in the person of Mrs. Ancheta who came from Hong Kong and brought with them some pre-loved clothes here to be distributed to the kids. These were the set of school supplies given to them. And these were the uh, some of the food and materials that were also given to them. It's a pail with sutanghon and some ingredients for their notcha buena. Sleepers also were given to them. These are the sleepers. And I am very thankful because uh, I don't have to ask for any donations. They just came in through private messages. They asked me on how they could help for the improvement of the project. And on December 28, another Pamaskong Handog, this was the initiative of my brother-in-law in the person of Roderick Macariola, who is really one of my rock for this project, in the implementation of this project. He is really a great help to me, especially in the documentation part and on the... Uh, looking of possible sponsors most of the gifts distributed during this event came from his friends from far eastern university who really don't want again to be mentioned and they they just want to help without mentioning their names these are complete uh, not chabuena packs from Board member Kyle Bulut again. Uh, the t-shirts, if you notice, we have same t-shirts, white for them and black for us, uh, the organizer. This was in sponsored by a good friend of mine uh, whom I met way back last uh, July in Korea because he was also a scholar in Korea, now in Switzerland. She, uh, he sponsored the t-shirts and I really thank him for that. So we had many games for the kids and they really enjoyed. The first picture, they were singing as a Christmas carol. They entertained the visitors. Uh, here is my supportive PSDS in the person of uh, Dr. Marizon P. Castillo, who graced the event with his, uh, with her IPMR husband. Her husband is hap happened to be our IPMR here in Puntol Apayao. And this was last January 26, 2020. 
with the help of Mom Diana Rose Iban uh, from the office of MSWDO, who helped me facilitate the session. Okay, our ninth session, this was last February 9, 2020. So every Sunday after my graduate school class, I always uh, feel excited. I am always excited to come home because I have to travel two to three hours to attend my my uh, graduate studies. And then right after that, when I arrive home, I have to start again these sessions for these kids. This was last August 1, 2020, the Balik Escuela program. I sponsored this iConnect mask to be distributed to them and some of the school supplies from the different sponsors I already distributed to them in time for the opening of the school year with the help again of Ma'am Marjorie Malapit from the NCIP office of Puttulapayao. Since there are many school supplies, uh, I shared it with my regular grade four learners in my own school. Another Balik Escuela program, this was the supplies given by Sir Jason Pimentel of Akyat Tulung Adventure Team. We distributed it last October for 2020 with the help of the ML in the person of uh, Sir Ramon Antonio and Mom Diana Rose Iban. Okay, these are the project impact. I was uh, one of the winners during the 2020 online SAEM conference. I also had the opportunity to share my experiences, personal experiences as an IP during the International Day of World's Indigenous People. Thank you to UNAP, United Nations Association of the Philippines for this opportunity. And then I was able to be one of the hand-picked schools among the two schools in the Philippines. And thank you to Sir Jim for this opportunity, Sir Vikas, and to Director Mards for this um, one-of-a-lifetime opportunity to be showcased to the whole world. And another... I was one of the five teachers who was listed on the top 100 on T4 Solution Challenge by Take Action Global, launched by Con Teamers on the Earth Project. And I was featured as one of the... Uh, should they say, uh, heroes in the DepEd ICO Facebook page. Thank you to our very supportive talent manager, Director Mars Ballesteros, for this opportunity. And, okay, if you want to be, if you want to have more information about what I am doing, you can reach me through these contact numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jim. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandler Ipabao. Um, we're very amazed at your work uh, with the Indigenous people communities in Apayao. And for sure, our audience right now, those who are watching us have some questions, but to our audience or our viewers, please hold on to your questions for a while. Um, we will have um, an open forum for our question and answer uh, portion for our speakers. And I'm pretty sure you have amazing questions or even insights that we would like to share to us. 
by the way, before we proceed, we've noticed a lot of, co of comments that you've been sharing. Um, just also, uh, we also want to hear your thoughts and insights, and we will be flashing some of your thoughts and insights as we go on with our uh, with our program right now. So thank you so much, Dr. Chandler Ibabao. Uh, we will see you later you. at the Open Forum. All right. So for our next part, we have a video presentation from none other than Dr. Sadat Minandang. He is a Princess Maha Shakri Awardee 2019 who hails from the school's division of Cotabato City. Just to introduce uh, Dr. Sadat, Dr. Minandang is a master teacher one and currently an officer in charge of one of the elementary schools in District 5, Schools Division of Cotabato City, Region 12, Philippines. Before his affiliation to the Department of Education, Dr. Minandang engaged in, in a non-government organization as humanitarian worker, facilitating psychosocial interventions for internally displaced persons and children due to man-made and natural calamities in Mindanao. He was hired as a teacher in 2013 and, and was designated as guidance co coordinator and focal person of different programs and projects. For seven years, he served as a public school teacher and he became a multi-awarded educator. He is a resource speaker, classroom and street educator, training facilitator, writer, innovator, researcher, community organizer, and a catalyst of change. He is the proponent of the Tula Kaalaman or Push Knowledge and now Biaheng Kaalaman Mobile of Knowledge to reach the unreached children, out of school children and children at risk for dropping out in schools. And like what I've said a while ago, Dr. Minandang received the prestigious Princess Maha Chakri Award in Bangkok, Thailand. So let us get ready as we watch his video presentation for all of us. My greetings of peace to everyone. My courtesy and respect to the Department of Education Secretary, Leonor Magpolis Briones, to the International Cooperation Office headed by Dr. Margarita C. Palisteros, to the Director of SOC Sergeant Region 12, Dr. Alan G. Parnaso, CSO 4, to Schools Division Superintendent of Cotabato City, Dr. Conception F. Balawag, CESO 5. To my co-speakers for today's forums, participants from different regions, good morning. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's an honor and opportunity to be invited as one of the speakers in this forum to share with you my project and advocacy, especially touching the lives of indigenous people families, and children through education. My project, Tula Kaalaman or Push Knowledge, found in 2017, accommodated uh, community children. In 2019 and uh, 2018 and 19, the Tula Kaalaman served out-of-school children and pupils at risk of dropping out in school. And uh, currently, the project is accommodating the IT children which is the Bajau children in Cotabata City. Bajau is belongs to cultural minority as indigenous people. Bajau means 
man of the seas. This is this tribal group is known as the sea gypsies because they move with the the wind and the tide on their small houseboats called pintas. They can be found in many coastal settlements in inhabit the waters and shores of the Sulu archipelago. And the Bajau families in the Cotabato city are usually migrants from island province of Mindanao, mostly uh, from Sulu and Tawi-Tawi. The best thing to give these people is education. That is why my projects on each uh, phase three implementation supported by the Princess Mahachakri Award Foundation came to realize and this time accommodating these indigenous people, the Bajau children in Cotabata City. Now, let me show and share to you the journey of my project from Tula Kaalaman means push knowledge to Biyahin Kaalaman or mobile of knowledge and also to adopt the new normal education and how the projects could help and encourage these children to go back to school or encourage to continue their education.
According to Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world. Hence, education must continue whatever challenges and circumstances come, and education has to adapt in times of pandemic. Except for the PMCE Foundation as the main sponsor of the program, I would like to thank and extend my gratitude to the DepEd International Cooperation Office headed by Dr. Balisteros, our DepEd Regional Office 12 headed by Dr. Alan G. Parnaso, Office of the Member of the Parliament, the Simban Ramos of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region for Muslim Mindanao, Congressman Dato Ronnie Cusin Suwat of Maguindano, 1st District and Cotabata City, to the Inisyatibo ng Makabagong Pilipino through Honorable Bruce Matabalaw of Cotabato City, Office on Social Welfare and Development Services of the LGO Cotabato City, and the Mother Barangay Bagua and Mother Barangay Kalamanan of Cotabato City. And of course, to the SDO Cotabato City, headed by Dr. Conception F. Balawag, testified for the support and recognition of this endeavor. Thank you very much and happy Indigenous People Month. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And we are very thankful to Dr. Sadat Minandang, all the way from Cotabato City, who has recorded his very inspiring, amazing, and eye opening video for all of us to know what's really happening for his Indigenous cultural community in South Cotabato. So we have flown from Apayao, we have flown over to Cotabato, and we're flying towards Iloilo for our next speakers. Our next speakers will touch on customary laws, health practices, and risk management approaches of indigenous communities in Iloilo. Our next speakers are Ms. Elsie Padernal and Ms. Lord Jane Dordas. They are Panay Bukidnon teachers from Panay Island, Philippines. All right, so we have Mom Elsie on our screen. And Lord Jane also. We're just going to set up our presentation for them also. <laughs> Miss Elsie and Lord Jean, if you're ready. Miss Elsie, you may want to unmute.
Miss Elsie and Lord Jean, you may need to unmute yourself. Hi, Miss Elsie and Lord Jean. Okay. Hello, sir. Good morning. All right. I think our audience are wondering why are you together? Could you please tell us before you go on with your presentation? Yes, sir. We are sisters. All right. So, I'm a partner in uh, promoting the Panaybukid culture. All right. That's great to know. So they are sisters for those who were uh, wondering a while ago. All right. So the floor is now uh, on you, Elsie and Lord Jean, as you uh, present your presentation to us. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Nawi malaugan na idali ang natudugay Dugayan dali-dali ang sungkeda kita Sugida na nga madal Ito kapulanan Madaligan nga adlaw, madawgan nga kuraw Sa pagkahangulang tao, pagkarak it means good day, everyone. We are here to present to you the customary laws, health practices, and risk management approaches of Panay Bukid non communities. In Panay Island, Philippines, we have two groups of indigenous peoples, namely the Ati and Panay Bukid non. Panay Bukid non are the mountain dwellers in the interland. And Panay, who possess a land or territory known as ancestral domain and have a common bond of language, custom, tradition, culture, beliefs, and practices, are well known for their Sigidan and epic chanting, Binanug dance, which mimics the movements of a hawk, bird, and air, handmade embroidery or panubok, stories in an anan, music, handicrafts, weapons, arts, and other oral literature. Pictures. The epics of Panay with 14 volumes are reputed to be the longest epic in Asia. According to Dr. Alicia P. Magos, Professor Emeritus, Cultural Anthropologist of the University of the Philippines, Visayas, and the Caballero Brothers, who are the surviving epic hunters. And now it's our privilege to share with you the samples of an epic chant entitled Tico Cadillac. Mm, 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 Ahuron, hmm, di ko no ay owan, para di ay dang tubig at patang inini, gadi gamo dang bunto, pagdating ang dang bino. Who <laughs>
tumabukto magkita at ang durong kala sa rukar kahalim na Guru Yanan is a lullaby and Talga is a traditional song for friendship Nakanubon kagubon ng puno tayo tapado ng hirap tayo kapaligo Ikaw kapagkata kay halo Palugin na ang dugo kung kuwang po Simpo, katulap na yan Kapag gusto tayo kanyong maningala Na masulaw at agad malang ka Kapag ang pinasalang tayo Hulog na Alima Huwag ang magdrang Ay luha Mamba In the end of dancing, there are three types. First, the Tigbabayi, a single Kohan dancer opens the dance floor. Another is Tiglalaki, which is a couple dance. And lastly, the loop of or like rivalry dance. What we are doing today is the costume used in the end of dancing. Handmade embroidery of a knife. Thank you. Next slide, please. Come here, Nadiana. Come here. The transmitters of indigenous knowledge are the Binupot or Kit Maidens, Babaylans or Shamans, Paltira or Traditional Hilot or Manug Hilot, Cultural Masters and Culture Bearers. My sister and I are very fortunate that we are the granddaughters of Abinokot in the name of Preciosa Unguran Caballero, who plays a vital role in transmitting the knowledge and culture. The beauty here in the Abinokot tradition is that a beautiful woman, fair skin, was selected by their parents or elders and kept in a room for many years to preserve and pass on the culture to their next generation. They have their own Husay system in settling the problems in their community by a Manuhusay or Arbiter. In fact, we came from the family of Chanters and Manuhusay or Arbiter, and our father is a Manuhusay himself. Uh, he has solved, resolved many conflicts in our community, example, land and territories, conflicts, marriage, deaths, and material positions. Next slide, please. Now let's proceed to the customary loss of Panay Mukidman. It is a body of rules based on reason, consent, and necessity, and confirmed by common usage and dictates of society. It is according to Indigenous Peoples' Right Act 8371, which is known as the IPRA. Established way of doing things, prescribed form, right, ritual, routine procedure, social usage, and written law, which are observed by IPs, so that things which are done contrary to custom and manner of their ancestors are neither in order nor appear right. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
customary laws of Panay Bukidno. This law was made, witnessed, and approved by the group of elders or Magura, though it was not written or documented, yet it has been implemented and practiced by the Panay Bukidno in Panay, or along the Panay River, and Halawod or Halaw River in the central part of Panay. According to Romulo Amangbae Caballero, who is an IP leader, chanter, arbiter, folk historian, and cultural master, the words of the elders is like the word of the most powerful one that every member of in the community is obliged to follow. And by the way, what are the penalties for the failure to follow the rules and regulation of Panay Mutidno? We have the Rinansa. It is a payment. If somebody committed a serious crime or brought shame to the family and community, so it is paid by either money, which is wrapped in a precious embroidered handkerchief, which is equivalent to 50 pesos before, now estimated to 50,000 pesos. It could be material positions like pair of sanduku or bolo and banka or spear. And this is, or these are the weapons used uh, for war, and tibod or an antique jar, also panio or precious handkerchief. And another is uh, separation from the community. So if uh, the IPs uh, do not like to pay for this um, uh, renansang, for this renansang or separated from the community, so respect the law or the customary law of Panay Bukit. Yes. And here we are on the health practices of Panay Mukibnon. First, we have the Mariri Moon or Feniki. The elders are extremely or excessively particular, exacting, or meticulous in taste or standard. They practice or observe cleanliness, especially in their food. One best example of this, they do not eat exotic foods. They usually eat good, fresh, and healthy foods they eat on time, and another health practices, pabalhas, or perspiration, or the process of sweating through work exercise. A lubo of treatment, an ancient steaming, releasing of sweat in the body when not feeling well through traditional way by using boiling water with herbal, herbal plants, and a pahilot, manipulation and massage for the dislocation of joints and soothe each other. Rest management, which is culture-based among the Panay Bukidnon. So in order to do this, uh, the IPs go back to nature and culture. Number one, we have the physical measures on battle against COVID. The best example to this is the Pinoco tradition. So in our situation today, in the new normal, we are not new to this because we came from the family of uh, Pinoco which is secluded from the community from childhood to until getting married. And the, she learns the um, uh, culture and tradition, the values and spiritualities in our way of life. Another, another is measures used by community to survive the pandemic, the sustenance, such as food, sharing of food products and forage. This time of pandemic, Panay Bukidnon uh, group look for the availability of food to their surroundings. And they share this to their families, friends, and relatives in order to survive. Next slide, Number please. three, Orange. the cultural practices that help in healing COVID-related symptoms. So example to this is the use of herbal medicines. So the IPs um, look for the herbal medicines or uh, plants in their surroundings so they use as uh, medicines so the any uh, sickness. And how the customary law, health practices, and rest management of Panay Bukidnon indigenous peoples help them face and overcome the COVID-19 pandemic? Their obedience to their parents, elders, persons and authorities, rules and regulations is the best discipline during the time of pandemic wherein they will follow or obey the protocols given by the government to avoid the sp spread of coronavirus. Next is, next uh, Heavy endurance and long suffering is the reason why Panay Bukidnon IPs can survive when difficult situations come their way. 
especially this time of crisis, that many Filipinos lost their jobs, their jobs, and many families are hungry. They have extra courage to face and overcome every trial and problem. So hopeful that they believe this pandemic will end, the land will be healed, and everybody can survive. Next. The Next slide, please. They are aware not to stay in crowded places and keep distance from other people since they are trained to stay always at home unless necessary, like the practices of Binoko. Compassion, kindness, sympathy, love, and willingness to extend help to the needy are some of their spiritual values. For reflection, reflection. prayer and supplication is what the world needs today. Despite the lingering uncertainty, this pandemic silently offers us an opportunity to reflect on the spiritual impact it has on the world and our communities. God bless everyone. Stay safe. Pagkahangulang salamat. Thank you very much. And God bless us all. Lord Jane and Elsie, thank you so much for sharing about uh, the cultural practices, especially um, the risk management health uh, practices of the Panay Bukidnon in Iloil, uh, in, in the Panay Island. So we're very much thankful because you presented a different side of how we are safeguarding our people, cultural communities at this time of the pandemic. So we're not only focusing on the academic side, but we're very much aware also that, you know, um, the social, emotional, physical health and security are uh, of equal importance or might be even more important uh, as of our situation right now. So, Lord Jane and Elsie, we thank you so much. We will still have them um, as we proceed to the next speaker. Later on, if you have comments or if you have questions, not just to Lord Jane, Elsie, to all uh to shander also we will have them for our open forum um in a while so thank you lord jane and elsie please stay with us as we get ready for our next speaker for our next speaker i am very much happy to introduce her she is a very uh she's a very close friend of mine um we belong to the same um year uh when i was nominated for the global teacher prize in 2017 she emerged as the grand winner uh, for our year. She's no other than Maggie McDonnell. Maggie McDonnell is the 2017 win, uh, winner of the Global Teacher Prize. She sought out opportunities to teach indigenous communities in Canada and for the last six years has been a teacher in a fly-in Inuit village called Saluit, nestled in Canadian Arctic. This is home to the second northernmost Inuit community in Quebec with a population of just over 1,300. It cannot be reached by road, only by air. In winter, temperatures are minus 25 Celsius. There were six suicides in 2015, all affecting young males between the ages of 18 and 25. And she, um, she sends her apologies for not being here with us, but we have a very, very special video that would remind us of how she have worked hard as an educator in her indigenous community up north in Canada in the Arctic Circle. So let us get ready to watch her video presentation for her work uh, in Canada. Whenever I'm working with young people, my goal is to be able to give them the tools that they need to be masters of their own destiny. My name is Maggie McDonnell, and I'm a teacher working in Salowit, Nunavik, Canada. The definition of a teacher here is a lot more broad than it might be if you were a teacher in Toronto, or Halifax, or Montreal. In an Inuit community, you have this privilege of being able to build these very authentic relationships with your students and with the community. 
a lot of young people go and talk to her because they have trust on her. So I think she's a very precious person to the to the community. Do you remember the dates, Alana? The majority of the challenges that Salawit faces are rooted in the colonial history. And as a result, now, youth on a daily basis face a lot of trauma in the community. Currently, many activists consider that the region of Nunavik to be in a suicide crisis right now. Witnessing the funerals of my students is one of the hardest things I've ever gone through. And I never want to be in that position again. As an educator, I build programs that cultivate resilience, hope, and build self-belief in my students. These tools come together to combat suicidal thoughts. I'm very lucky to be teaching in a project-based classroom, so I have a lot of freedom. This year, I've really focused on a lot on art-based projects because I find it's particularly therapeutic for them to express themselves in those means. Lastly, a very important project that we've been doing for the last four years is a, a project I call Students Feeding Students. In this project, my students every day create a healthy snack for the entire school body. The students are coming in with a lot of baggage. Uh, they've been in criminal trouble, known for vandalism, they're known for dropping out of school, they're known for bullying. So I'm trying to create projects for them to contribute to the community in really meaningful ways. Maggie is really an expert at having a more open learning environment. I've seen the students go from one of the students that maybe caused the most trouble in the school to the student that helped the school out the most and is now an employee at the school. So Maggie's open approach to education, I feel, uh, can really uh, motivate kids that have uh, difficult home lives. I'm also very proud of the cooperative work placement at the daycare. It is a mutually beneficial partnership. My daycare would not run without Maggie and her fantastic girls. We are training them to be future leaders for the daycare and hopefully they will take over my job. They're gaining so much confidence, so much self-esteem and so much value and meaning from working there. I've always been so passionate about sport and physical activity as a tool to build resilience in young people, but I've literally seen it and tasted it here on a day-to-day -day basis in Salowit. And it's not just about the athletics or this performance-based outcome. Along the way, there's so much youth development going on. When I'm working with my runners, an expression I use a lot is that when you run by yourself, you go fast. But when you run with others, you can go so far. I've had youth who've joined the running club. They've actually quit smoking cigarettes. Some have quit smoking marijuana. Some have even come back to school. I've even had youth come to me and tell me when they were going through a very troubled time when they were having suicidal thoughts, that they were able to use exercise and running as a coping tool to deal with that. She's been my teacher, my coach, my trainer. Through the years, she has become like a family to me. I am just thankful for everything she has done for me my family and for the town. If it wasn't for Maggie, I wouldn't never experience of being in college. We're so happy that Maggie came to our village because she was helping young people. She's a role model for the whole community. I think so many people come to the Arctic and they come here and they're mesmerized by the land. But what has always inspired me is the youth that I work with. I really believe they're the true Northern Lights. I'm just here trying to find ways to take down barriers or challenges so that they can shine, so that they can dance, so that they can light up our lives. And that is the very inspiring video of our friend Maggie McDonald, all the way from Canada. And there is a special presentation also 
uh, we've tried uh, we've tried to invite um, the winner for 2019 Global Teacher Prize. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have him right now. But we are very much inspired by the work that he's been doing um, in in Kenya in Africa. So I will be also uh, we will be sharing his video. We will be sharing his video for everyone to see and appreciate the work that he has done for his own community in Kenya in Africa. All right, we're having some technical concern again with our video, but it's okay. Instead, we will let you watch it uh, before we end our forum today. But before we end our forum today, I'm going to bring in our speakers and one important person who is behind this special event, um, Dr. Jesus Insalada. He's a principal in, uh, in the schools division in Iloilo, has, has been a, the focal person for Indigenous People Education Program in his division. So let me bring in our speakers again for your questions and for your comments. So uh, let's welcome again Dr. Chandler. Dr. Chandler uh, Ibabao. Um, doc, um, yes, Doc. Dr. Jesus Insalada and Lord Jane and Elsie. If you've noticed, Lord Jane and Elsie and Dr. Jesus, they are in the same room. Um, they have traveled all the way from their community, all the way from the community to Iloilo City. I think that's the nearest city in their place so that they can be with us. So for those who have been very, very understanding of our technical concern, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Jesus, Lordin, and Elsie has really traveled down yes. to the nearby metropolitan city in Iloilo to make sure that they get to share their presentation yes. all right so it seems like our audience are very quiet right now they're very appreciative of of how uh, of what you have shared of what you have shared uh from apaya bukit non and of course our friend uh dr minanda from potabato so there is one question that we have right now but let me go read first this is from uh, this is from Rest Tolentino, Dr. Chandler, since face-to-face -face is not allowed during this pandemic, what other strategies can you suggest to continue reaching out to ITAS? Thanks, Madha. So, Dr. Chandler, this question is addressed to you. Okay. Um, yes, it's really true that we are not allowed to conduct face-to-face -face learning with our learners, but since here in our province, Moji. I think Dr. Chandler has been cut off with his internet. Um, we have the same situation in, 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 in Iloilo, right? Dr. Jesus, maybe you can share to us uh, what you have been doing this, uh, at this time of the pandemic. We use, uh... Hello, I just would like to check if my audio is okay. Okay. Yes, yes, it's very clear. Uh, in the case of the Panay Bukidnon communities here in the Panay Island, uh, we've been um, having different modalities and channels to reach out to our uh, indigenous uh, learners. Of course, so we need to have support from the community leaders uh, because through them we could communicate, um, could give feedback to our uh, learners uh, through their uh, parents. Uh, when uh, um, when channels or when uh, communication is open, like the provision of internet, for example, or if there are uh, phone signals, then uh, as part of our learning delivery modality. Um, 
strategies. We have to uh, reach out to the parents by calling, texting, and if there is also um, internet connection, we could make use also of social media, like the most common um, app that we use is the Facebook Messenger. So uh, we reach out to them. And uh, another is that um, uh, through my radio program, we have um, uh, a radio program where we could give uh, instructions or announcements to our communities. Um, I manage and uh, sustain a radio program on uh, IP ed uh, advocacy, but uh, we could also make use of the time slot to give important announcements to the parents. Like for example, just recently we had um, uh, cases, uh, COVID cases, and we had to immediately uh, stop the distribution and retrieval of outputs, distribution of modules and retrieval of uh, uh, outputs. So I think radio-based instruction or radios are very important uh, medium to reach out uh, to the parents or to give instructions and uh, updates to the parents. Um, with the help of the elders, uh, because we have customary laws on um, securing borders. We have to always uh, coordinate with the elders uh, when they're going to give instructions. So the elders are always there to, uh, uh, to relay the message to the households, to the parents, and so the parents could relay the message to their children. You know, we have uh, typographical um, hindrances or challenges but uh, I think uh, what is highlighted is our sense of community in order to uh, make communication uh, multi-directional and to make uh, communication fast. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very that's a wonderful uh, answer, Dr. Jesus. I like that you really emphasize the importance of the community. I think mm -hmm. the whole celebration of the indigenous people, cultural communities, is really about highlighting the importance of the community. Uh, we've been doing hashtag, we heal as one, we learn as one. And those are not hashtags. Even, those are rooted in our communities. And our discussion right now with our indigenous uh, community brothers and sisters really reminds us that, you know, in order for us to face the challenges, whether it's the pandemic or any other challenges, it's really important that we find ourselves rooted in mm -hmm. our own community. So wonderful answer, Dr. Jesus. Dr. Chandler is back with us, but before I go to Dr. Chandler, um, I'm just gonna welcome Director Margarita Ballesteros. Uh, she's uh, already with us again. Um, Dr. Chandler, um, how have you been helping your community right now at this time of the pandemic, especially with you know uh, the not the, the non possibility of face to face learning? Dr. Chandler, it may, she's... I think uh, she is encountering another uh, technical problem. All right. Uh, yeah. Going back to the sharing of uh, Mom LC and Mom Lord Jane, IP and teachers in our area, uh, I think it is our advantage. We're working on our advantage in... Uh, like one advantage is that when teachers are really coming from that community, when teachers are really part of that community, uh, for example, in the case of Mom, uh, Lord Jane and Mom Elsie, it would be very easy for them to reach out to their learners knowing that um, uh, people in the community are uh, feel secure, uh, they know Mom Elsie and Mom Lord Jane, and they could easily uh, connect with their learners who are not, uh, who are their distant relatives, they are neighbors and uh, uh, good friends. So parents are uh, parents do not worry when uh, Mom LC and Mom Lord Jane would uh, gather like three or five learners in their neighborhood. I think that is what they are practicing right now. And when uh, elders also serve as uh, volunteer teachers, then that would be very helpful. Um, they themselves teach the. The, the children in the community with the help and guidance of IP teachers like Mom Lord Jane and Mom Elsie. All right. Um, there is one question here from our viewer named Angel Cortez. Thank you so, uh, so much, Angel. Um, what would be the most challenging for our IP communities in these trying times? Uh, what could be the most challenging 
uh, things that our IP communities are experiencing right now. Chandler is here. Hi, Chandler. <laughs> hey, mom. Chandler, um, the, the question is, what would be the most challenging of our IP community? So if you could tell us the most challenging, just one, what is the most challenging part of our IP communities? Chandler, you may want to start. You may, uh, you need to unmute yourself, Chandler. <laughs> it's okay so now. I think the most challenging, yeah, okay. I think the most challenging part on the part of a teacher, especially here in our province is we don't have a stable internet connection. So teachers should go. to check on the learners uh, most of us especially those who are assigned to the mountains mountainous area should walk miles to reach the learners riding on a banka or riding on their motorcycle or using their bare feet to walk just to reach the learners bringing in the modules retrieving in the modules back to the classroom and some parents who are really supportive would really come to the school especially for the parents of kinder and grade one so we have the so-called parents class so the teacher now should give instructions to the parents and then later the parents will echo those instruction to their kids especially when we say kindergarten it's the foundation of these kids on how to read and write by merely uh, teaching them the correct pronunciation of the letters is really a big help to these kids for them to easily learn on how to read and write that's all sir Dr. Chandler, I love what uh, I love that you started with your answer in the challenges, and I think it's not you know where it's 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 common knowledge that we have challenges in the internet, but I like how you ended it because it gives a sense of hope. You did not only stop with the challenges, but I love also that you mentioned the role of parents right now. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Jesus has been telling us about the importance of the community. The smallest unit of the community is the family. Right, and parents play a very, very important role. Um, the audience of Empower Ed TV, I love uh, Empower Ed, uh, knows that I love to share. Right, my mother is a public school teacher, so are my sisters. And you know, um, I look at their pictures, and what I love when they when I saw the pictures that they've been sharing to me is you know, they're a testament of the hard work of the teachers. And we love that parents are helping because, like, what uh, Jesus has mentioned in indigenous uh, cultural communities, the role of parents is an essential. It's a cornerstone. In a, it's, a, it's a cornerstone. So therefore, even in this time of the pandemic, very trying times, the role of parents, the role of family shines further. Wonderful answer, Dr. Chandler. Um, we have one, another question here, which is, I think, very, very important. Um, I think they they were inspired by your work because of the project, I, uh, the work of everyone here. Um, the question from Reynan Morado Senyo to our resource speakers, what is the primary factor that motivates you to do these initiatives and project of yours? So I think this is a very, very important question. I think this, this could inspire other teachers also in the country. Let's start, um, Lord Jean, Lord Jean and Elsie. Hello. 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 Lord Jean and Elsie. Hello, sir. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, as daughters of Chapton, of Barangay Chieftain in our community. Uh, we belong to the farthest far flung barangay in Capiz, and LC is from the mountain of Kalinog. 
um, uh, we the primary factor that motivates us is that as as future leader of Panay Bukidnon community, uh, it is our due to took the initiative to deliver learnings to our peoples, even though it's very hard for us. And in addition to that, Miss Elsie, I peace was enough uh, was yeah, uh, uh, the primary factor that uh, motivates us to. Uh, do these projects or to continue doing these projects is that our love or passion to our okay. to the indigenous peoples because we teach in the IP communities. So our love to the children that even though it is very hard for us and despite the pandemic we challenge we we help the children the parents and the people in the community. Uh, how what are the importance of uh, or how we handle the situations that uh, during these trying moments uh, we go back to the culture and the tradition what the our um, ancestors uh, 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 leave behind us or leave behind that we continue to do this today the trainings the values formation uh, everything that uh, the, the elders uh, teach us so we apply it today. Uh, like say, for example, the food, the sharing of uh, food and helping the needy. And the trainings also, the, like the in Bidoko tradition, that how to stay at home and how to follow all the rules and regulations. And also we continue. It is to, our privilege to teach our culture now. Yes, we have, the, the, we have the enough time to document and to teach our culture and tradition to our children. Mm -mm. Our epic chants, the beauty of chanting, um, yes. singing, the dance, uh, the handmade embroidery, our, like our clothes, uh, we made this and the uh, accessories. Uh, accessories. And also we do not thank the pandemic, but uh, it has also positive uh, aspects. Uh, we value, impact or, uh, yes, it has positive impact to us. Like uh, when we stay at home, we have uh, the time to, for uh, prayer devotion with our family and uh, for storytelling, the Hinon An and the chance we learn. And also um, we, we give uh, time uh, time to our children and parents and uh, write the literatures. Uh, I am writing the composto about uh, COVID-19. <laughs> like and so. also, uh, 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 publish, you have your publication? Customary loss to be published. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to be published, the customary loss of Panay All right. Thank you, Lord Jane and Elsie. And, you know, this is a very candid remark. And... Uh, the director March would uh, love this. Um, I've I've met Laura Jean and Elsie in person when yes. we were in Capiz, yes. and you know, in a very very special way, um, I have witnessed their love for their culture. Um, they said uh, they said, and I would love to agree that it's an honor for them, it's a privilege for them to really continue the cultural traditions that they have. I've I've heard. Uh, we apologize for the audio a while ago, but I've heard in person the chant of Lord Jane and Elsie when we were in Capiz, and it's really amazing. Um, until now, I have goosebumps <laughs> because of, of of how they really, you know, um, chanted with much passion and love for their culture. Um, Dr. Jesus, Dr. Jesus uh, has been known internationally for his work with the indigenous community in in the school's division of Iloilo. Um, what motivated you, Dr. Jesus? Before you answer, may we ask Lord Jane and Elsie to mute their mic. You're in the same room right now, so you're gonna do some echoes in there. Um, Dr. Jesus, you can unmute yourself and uh, share to us what motivates you. Dr. Jesus, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, is my audio yes, now okay? Yes, Dr. Jesus. Sir. Okay. <laughs> um, Please repeat the question. Okay. 
Uh, okay, um, Dr. Jesus is already answering. Uh, you will go after Chandler. The question is what motiva mm -hmm. what motivates you or what motivated you with your crime? Mm -hmm. Right? So Dr. Jesus would go first and then after Dr. Jesus, Chandler would go. Yeah, um, I think the major uh, reason or uh, the major factor uh, why we have this kind of adv advocacy uh, same with Mom Elsie and Mom Laura Jane is that our uh, own ancestry, our own uh, heritage, because we are Panay uh, Bukidnon and uh, we feel that it is our um, duty and responsibilities to uh, teach our culture for the next generation. And uh, much more that I now work with the Indigenous Peoples Education, I feel more inspired and at the same time uh, obliged to uh, continue the things that we have started in the name of indigenous people's education, culture-based education, or our advocacy on uh, culture propagation uh, in order to share this to not only to the present generation, but to the future generation. And we would like to highlight that uh, we need to be rooted in our own culture and, and identity because it is an accepted fact and statement that if we are rooted, then it would be very easy for us to find the meaning in the things that we learn, uh, not just like inside the, uh, the classroom or uh, uh, in the four corners of the classroom, but the things that we learn at home and in the community. I think we find more meaning when we talk about culture-based education in this um, time of the pandemic when face-to-face -face instruction is no longer allowed or not allowed for the meantime because um, the very principle of culture-based education is that we learn essential things and values first and foremost from the parents from the members of the family and from the members of the community. And uh, when we talk about community-based and culture-based education, first and foremost, uh, the persons in authority to share about culture and how we connect this with uh, the academics are our elders, our parents, our IP parents, and um, our IP uh, leaders and uh, culture advocates and culture leaders. I think, um, uh, we find meaning in what we in how we define culture-based education with the present pandemic and I think that is one positive aspect because parents stakeholders community leaders feel that this is the very essence of community-based and culture-based education all right thank you so much dr Jesus uh, let's go to dr Chandler dr Chandler is with us already uh, dr Chandler what motivates you to do your project, like Project Aita, uh, that you have shared a while ago? I think, sir, my motivation, my greatest motivation is my childhood experience. Being an IP, because I am also a daughter of a Tingyan from a native of Abra, my personal experiences when I was a kid really drives me to help these Agta children to be educated. That someday, somehow, maybe one of them, two or three of them, will be educated to lift up their academic or their economic stability of their own family. That someday, they will be the breadwinner of their family and help their kids, future generation, be educated and be a part of the community. Because I am also, uh, since childhood, I was able to witness how these kids or how their parents would go and jump to the river just to catch fish or to get uh, shells for them to sell on the streets even when it's raining motivated inspired to start this project uh, before it was just a mere i uh, it was just a mere 
re-entry program or application project because but then as i go on with this project generous people to help all right we're, we're having some yeah. technical concern um we have a question i have a question here while we wait for chandler director marge uh director marge balesteros has been really the person behind a lot of teachers uh, who have been pushing for projects and are being recognized. And I can attest to that. Dr. Jesus can attest to that. Uh, Director March, with your experience, uh, why is it necessary or, you know, what will can you tell our educators right now in connection with starting, sustaining? I think the key word there is sustaining projects, education projects, not just in the indigenous communities, but even to their own, um, you know, um, school communities. Um, well, Jim, thank you for that. Basically, um, projects come out, they pop out, not just because they're, it's, it's, it's there to pop out, but there is always a reason. And of the many reasons of all of these projects, if I may just uh, continue what the Chandler before I'll go into what you were uh, asking me to, to delve into, um, uh, Chandler's project came in as, uh, as her re-entry application project after her four months um, exposure or experience for the teacher exchange program with a small community and a school in, in, in Korea. This is under the, the, you have been hearing about the KPTEP program, which uh, personally I have been uh, shepherding and it has become a part of my personal advocacy also for the global citizenship education. And I, I didn't realize that Chandler was coming from, you know, from her very personal family experience. That's why her project came, came in and came out just like that. And I, I encourage her to keep going because uh, all these young girls and young boys in, in her area really are in need of, of help not only for them to survive but also for them to get education and we congratulate her for for doing that but in terms of sustaining it well projects can be sustained when we have partners when we have to to bank in the help and the support not only for the resources but also for their for their moral support I have noticed that even with you guys with the T4 activities and not only that, the kids to learn activities in UK and that of other um, GTP ambassadors worldwide that I am following, I have seen that sustaining the projects are not really that difficult if there is one or even two or more uh, agencies, both private and government, who are really um, supporting not only not only in terms of resources but acknowledging the the presence of all of these initiatives and helping them get to meet and get to be supported by others who have the same i mean if not the same but at least the same commitment not the same project but the commitment to really uh serve and make this uh, um projects or or advocacy part of of those who are really moving it. I mean, like um, Dr. Insilada, for example, now being uh, at the division office, he is now uh, really uh, looking at how he can best help not only the curriculum, but how it's going to be implemented. And he can even uh, bring in new ideas considering that his network is not only in Southeast Asia, but actually I could say it's the world. And for, for you, uh, Jem, you have been like, boom, going all over places. And uh, uh, there have been uh, questions like uh, my world, um, my world network group on the group chat, which I was included uh, because a friend in India added me and I was surprised to see educators from Colombia, um, from Peru, 
and as far as even as Mozambique. And I was, I was the other night. I was looking at their invitations and um, trying to. Um, I will discuss this later on with you guys. And I said this is not uh, my cup of tea, but I have, I have people who can actually uh, do things and move things even in in greater heights more than what I can do. But I would like to say that indeed, when there are projects, they are all meant for a reason. These are conceptualized. This come into being because there is a reason. So you ladies, the two beautiful ladies who I've met in Ilo Ilo for like an hour, <laughs> I would like to encourage you, I was listening to your chanting earlier, I would like to encourage you ladies that you keep passing on that skill to the younger generation now. Do not wait until you grow your gray hair do not wait until you can no longer sing or you can no longer walk and go meet people in your communities. Do it now. It can be done well, not only with the help of, of Dr. Jess, maybe Jim can come into the picture and bring you like, not only um, recording it, recording them, but sharing them not only with your own IP groups, but also for all of us. They are, these are all meant to be preserved and these are all meant to continue because they are part of the package of who we are as a country and as Filipinos and as who you are as a community in Panay, uh, Bukidnon. I wish I could be there right now. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Director Mark. Um, we, we, we have some questions here, um, but we don't have much time to answer them. And some of the questions really are very much, you know, complex that we might not be able to have the time to really discuss it further. Uh, I'm just going to bring in Chandler again uh, here. Um, I just want to take that some time to thank everyone. Chandler, uh, that we have been having technical concern, but uh, I'll just give you a, a few minutes right now. Um, do you have any final words maybe for our, for our audience? Uh, maybe you can go back to what you were sharing about your motivation and maybe inspire also our audience right now. Okay, sir. Um, I just would like to thank my whole family, the DepEd ICO family, for giving me all the support I need for this project my family, my husband, my kids, and my brother-in-law, and my DepEd family uh, from Alem Elementary School, from the Division of Apayao, Cordillera Administrative Region, all the, all, all the support I have been receiving since I started this project, I thank you very much. Words are not enough to thank you all, but from the bottom of my heart, I really thank you. Uh, to our DepEd, ICO director, our supportive talent manager, as we say, uh, thank you so much. I will continue my advocacy in helping our dear brothers and sisters in my community and All right, I think uh, we're having a technical concern, but that's uh, okay. I think we got the message of, of Chandler right now. Uh, thank you for those who have been really supporting our indigenous people, cultural communities at this time around. So before we end, uh, before we end and we transition to the next part, I'm just going to say thank you to Lord Jane, um, LC, Dr. Jesus Insalada, uh, Dr. Chandler, Oh, by the way, Lord Jane and Elsie and Jesus, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Jesus will have his final message later on, but we're just going to use this time again to express our gratitude uh, to these one, three wonderful persons who have traveled down. Uh, I'm not quite sure if you are in Iloilo City, but I know that you have to travel down because I've been there in their place, and you have to go down to the city to be uh, to be with us. Dr. Chandler, thank you so much. Um, despite the challenges, uh, despite the challenges that we have right now, uh, we're very much uh, happy and proud of the work that you have. 
And of course, Dr. Di uh, Director Margarita Ballesteros, thank you so much for always um, collaborating and making sure that we celebrate every single teacher, whether they're teaching IEPs or non-IEPs at all. Uh, we're very much thankful for your support and for the crew and staff uh, of the DepEd International Cooperations Office. And thank you also to DepEd, uh, Department of Education in the Philippines, for always supporting our teachers right now. We have a very special video, uh, and we hope it works uh, it will work right now. So we're just going to remove ourselves from your screen uh, so that we can give space to our video. <laughs> again, I'm back. Um, pleasant morning once again. Um, much insights and wisdom have been said, and uh, we really appreciate. It is very significant that we have this kind of opportunity and platform to discuss very timely issues in the context of the present uh, pandemic. Uh, different perspectives have been heard, and um, we come to realize that um, uh, our sense of oneness, our sense of community, uh, and the idea that uh, we have each other's back is very uh, comforting, uh, especially in these trying times. Um, of course, we are very grateful and um, uh, we are very grateful for the opportunity, for the support system we are getting uh, especially from uh, the different agencies who have been working with us to promote the rights and uh, privileges of the indigenous cultural communities, especially our IP at implementing teachers, our IP teachers and learners. Of course, our very profound thanks to Dr. Margarita Consolacion C. Balesteros of the International Cooperation Office have been working with us since we were discovered <laughs> and our stories were highlighted through the support of the International Cooperation Office uh, um, by sharing our stories to not only to our fellow Filipinos but to uh, other teachers and different communities abroad. Um, of course, we are very grateful for the time and wisdom shared to us by the Indigenous Peoples uh, Education Section of DepEd Central Office. And um, we really appreciate the time given to us by uh, Ma Maria uh, Lori C. Victor, the head of the FCU Central Office. And I would like also to uh, special mention our uh, uh, school's division superintendent, school's division of Iloilo, who really has a very big heart to uh, cater to the needs of the indigenous people's education section and for the uh, and for our indigenous uh, um, learners here in the schools division of Iluilu, which is considered as one of the biggest divisions in the the Dep ed especially in terms of ip uh, population of ip learners our schools division superintendent dr Ruel F. Bermejo. Of course, we would like to acknowledge and give our um, big thanks to our highly esteemed uh, pool of speakers, our expert speakers, uh, Director uh, Ethel Agnes Pasco Valenzuela, SEMU Director in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, we have also Maggie 
our uh, Maggie McDonnell, uh, 2017 winner of the very prestigious um, Global Teacher Prize. Um, we know that uh, she is now in a very difficult situation because she has also to, she is about to deliver her next baby. Next, we have Mom Chandler Ibaba, who has been also with us uh, in our advocacy. I think we have common advocacies on uh, serving our indigenous uh, learners in our own respective culture, uh, indigenous cultural communities. We have uh, we have also to acknowledge uh, Commissioner Jennifer. Uh, Pia C. Buglas, uh, who is, uh, whose heart really, uh, who's representing National Commission on Indigenous Peoples and whose heart really belongs to the Indigenous cultural communities and if not only of um, connection difficulty, um, perhaps she could uh, join us, she should have joined us this morning. Of course, to my two uh, fellow Indigenous uh, cultural advocates and also IPAD teachers, Mom Lord Jane Sidordas and Mom Elsie Sipadernal, they are uh, uh, relaying their uh, gratefulness, especially to the International Cooperation Office, especially to uh, Dr. March Balesteros for the opportunity uh, to share their um, culture and at the same time their practices and their story as uh, indigenous, uh, as teachers, as IP teachers themselves serving indigenous cultural communities. Of course, our good friend from the Bindanao area, we have Dr. Sadat Minantang, who is also a very busy person, but we know that his heart also belongs, really belongs to, but his heart really belongs to the indigenous cultural communities in his area. The forum has offered uh, to all ICCs, especially IP teachers and learners, the idea and the inspiration the support and uh, the realization that together we can manage the risk brought by the pandemic and as one uh, and and we heal as one we highlighted in our conversations in our dialogues we highlighted the message of collaboration and concern with one another and i think that is very powerful uh, strength that we could use in um, facing the pandemic, our sense of collaboration and concern with one another as uh, manifested and as um, uh, expressed in our indigenous cultural communities. And it's time for us to really look at our indigenous cultural communities, their resilience, their um, their strength and learn from them, learn with them. Uh, the academe, for example, is really looking into the indigenous cultural communities and looking to how we can, uh, the things that we can get from them uh, so that the non-IP communities could learn from them at the same time, adapt also and respect uh, their protocols, their customary laws and their own coping mechanisms that we could also apply not just in indigenous cultural communities but also in non-indigenous uh, communities and um, we also would like to highlight this uh, messages that we could send not only to the whole philippines but to the whole world telling our stories of resiliency uh, and uh, the faith the the empowerment that really coming from ourselves the empowerment that we give to others and um, the, the, the ideas uh, that are translated into actions as we continue to manage the risk brought about by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, our special thanks go to the Department of Education led by our um, very uh, active and very uh, uh, loving um, DepEd Secretary Leonor Magdolis Briones, to all our USEX and ASEX, our International Cooperation Office led by Dr. Marge Ballesteros, and um, to our schools division of Iloilo. But of course, um, our regional director, I would like also to mention Director uh, Maria Gemma M. Ledesma, um, DepEd Regional Office 6, Western Visayas, and of course, our schools division of Iloilo led by our SDS, Ruel F. Bermijo, with the support full support of our uh, ASDSS, Dr. Uh, Nordidi Shazun Jr., Dr. Uh, Azucena Palales, and Dr. Lilibeth T. is talking with all our chief uh, supervisors, 
our program handlers and supervisors and specialists and everybody to all our uh, collaborators to all our uh, partner uh, organizations thank you very much and i offer we offer this forum to all our ip teachers and learners all over the philippines and all over the world thank you very much and uh, see you soon i hope that this is not just this is not the first and the last collaboration uh, with the empower ed empower ed is our very strong partner when it comes to technology when it comes to using different platforms in uh, uh, in um, um, uh, coming across with our stories and our messages and i would like to make a special mention um mr uh francis jim uh, uh francis jim toscano and um to uh, of course to the men and women of the international cooperation office of the department of education our salute to dr march balisteros our unequal talent manager thank you very much Thank you so much, Dr. Jesus Encelada. So um, it, it's been a pleasure for us to go back on air um, with, with, with Rested, the Empower Ed uh, Advocacy Rested for a few, for a few weeks, a few months, and we're very happy to come up with our first um, Empower Ed Live again with the celebration for Indigenous cultural communities. And thank you so much also to DepEd, DepEd ICO, and DepEd Iloilo, and Dr. Jesus for bringing this one. Again, we did this to celebrate the diversity, uh, to appreciate, to tell the stories of our dear brothers and sisters from our IP communities. Empower Ed uh, is a platform that celebrates teachers. It is also a platform that celebrates IP teachers. And for this, we thank you so much for um, taking part in our international forum. For the evaluation, we will be we we are awarding certificates to our speakers, of course, courtesy of the Department of Education (ICO), and it's the same. Uh, we also have a certificate of participation for our live audience right now. Uh, we've been posting the link on our screen and even in our comment. But please know that if you're watching and you were not able to get the link to the certificate, we have we will be posting over at Empower Ed Facebook page and at Dep and ICO page uh, for the link so that you can give the, uh, you can answer the evaluation and receive the certificate. Um, the certificate will be electronically sent to your emails. Uh, so make sure that when you answer the form, you put in the proper, uh, the correct spelling of your name, uh, the correct spelling of your email, because for every single mistake, that's the one that will, uh, the that's, that's the one that our system will follow. So before you send, make sure that you check your email, make sure that you check the spelling of your name. So again, thank you so much. It's 11.30 and I'm sure we're, gonna, we're going to get ready for our lunch. Thank you so much, everyone. Please tune in again. Thank you and subscribe to our Empower Ed channel over at YouTube and like us on Facebook. Goodbye, everyone. Dr. Jesus, goodbye. Goodbye to our... Goodbye. Speaker. And uh, we look forward to more uh, forum like this.